thank you. Um, there's about four more hours of this talk. <laughs> um, two reels is, well, 40 minutes is all that Paramount will let me show in conjunction with my personal appearances, which is probably reasonable and fair enough. Um, but it does stop rather abruptly, as you may notice. Um, Hertha Oberhäuser, Military Tribunal Number 1, finds and judges you guilty and condemns you to a prison term of five years, I think it was. Sorry. Um, let me just try to bring you up to date on what happens immediately after the blackout that you just saw and how our search for the concentra concentration camp doctor in Schleswig-Holstein came to an end. As you saw, the film cross-cuts between her testimony in the Nuremberg courtroom and um, our attempts to catch up with her in Germany. She had indeed moved to the Rhineland, and after a few false starts, that's where I finally came face to face with Dr. Hertha Oberhäuser. I saw her, and I talked to her for a few minutes, but the audience never gets to see her. All you hear on the soundtrack is her very polite, very soft-spoken refusal to be interviewed. This is because I was doing something that is not really my profession. It's more along the lines of E. Howard Hunt. I was uh, not a very appetizing thing to do. I was wearing a, a mic, a secret mic, connected uh, by, <coughs> by wireless to the, to the sound equipment. And I did this with a whole series of convicted war criminals, not to use it, but simply perhaps to do a montage of their refusal to be interviewed. And finally, I, because I felt that a refusal to be interviewed is not an invasion of privacy. Or perhaps that's just the alibi that I gave myself. Anyway, in this one case, I did, I did use it. And uh, for a very specific reason, because what you hear on the soundtrack is a very polite and very soft-spoken refusal to be interviewed. She was quite an old woman, and she looked very tired, as most people do who are in the last stages of terminal cancer. So while you hear her voice, all you see is the exterior of a small apartment house. And then, as she offers to light up the dark staircase for me so that I can find my way out, the film cuts back to the scene that you already saw of the very young and rather attractive Hertha Oberhäuser in the Nuremberg dock, helping another defendant who happens to have only one arm and also pleads not guilty to put on his earphones. Now just for curiosity's sake, some of you might be interested to know what an old woman who had once tortured dozens, I mean the documents are overwhelmed, dozens of human beings, year in and year out, who had lethally infected open wounds and then sewn up the skin to keep the bacteria in the flesh, who had given gasoline injections to helpless inmates to see how long it would take them to die, and kept a log about this. Some of you might like to know what such a woman looked like. The naked and for me, the very bitter truth is that she reminded me very much physically, also in her voice, her demeanor, of one of my parents' closest and dearest friends, an old theater actress who appears briefly much later on in the course of the same picture. And this, I think, is one of the points of that particular sequence. It's also 
one of the points of that particular picture. And it lands us right in the middle of the controversy, which I think has arisen inevitably around various interpretations, various ways to receive or to reject whatever lessons such a film is attempting to convey. Is it repulsively sentimental or even morally degenerate, for instance, to point out that Nazis, torturers, and the organizers of mass genocide are human beings and that consequently we seem to share with them a number of attributes, like language, for instance, the instinct of self-preservation, perhaps loyalty to our own family, friends, or even more trivial things, love of music, enjoyment of mountains in wintertime and beaches in the summer, or just respect for the ordinary courtesies of daily life, as is so flagrantly the case with Dr. Herta Oberhäuser in Nuremberg and in that dark staircase where she refused be interviewed. Yes, many people do think that this is sentimental and degenerate. By emphasizing such banal facts of life, they feel the filmmaker is appealing to our sense of human solidarity on the cheap. He is softening us up. He is trading on the ignorance of, quote, the ignorance of youth and the cliches of fashionable thought in the post-war world on moral indifference, on historical relativism, on pop visions of World War II, on collective flights from responsibility, by these cheap appeals to our sympathies and even to our pity. At best, these insights may be irrelevant because they remove us too far from the inconceivable monstrosities of the gas chamber. I think these are serious and important arguments. And while I admit that they sometimes enrage me, less now than when the film first came out, because I had a lot of time to get, to get somewhat inoculated, but um, they do enrage me sometimes because I think that belief in monsters is a form of complacency and even sometimes a form of racism. Still, to reject such arguments out of hand would be, would seem to me to be incredibly callous. As so often in politics and the aspects of practical life, and I don't think there's really a separation between the two, that's one of my basic political beliefs that you can never make people, it's a form of escape to want to erect a wall between life and politics. There are no such walls. Uh, but as so often, the real question is one of alternatives, I think. And the real answer seems to me to be that the documentary filmmaker or any creative artist doesn't have a great deal of choice in the matter. People are what they are, or at least what they appear to be, in front of a camera, as in the pages of a realistic novel. To make them appear more monstrous than they portray themselves to be is not, I don't feel that this is really one of my prerogatives. And since a film about the Nuremberg trials 30 years after they took place would not, in my opinion, be very interesting without the presence on the screen of those who were accused and condemned, there you are. Self-portrayal is never very reliable portrayal. And in the case of some of the greatest criminals in recorded history, probably less so than in other cases. George Orwell once wrote something that stuck very much in my mind. He said, autobiography is only interesting if it reveals something disgraceful. <laughs> Since any life, when viewed from the inside, is nothing but a series of defeats, 
I'm a little perverse. I try these. I try this out on college audiences every once in a while, <laughs> and I'm always surprised to find that the laughter comes on the first part and never on the second. <laughs> the idea that um, Professor Lohman's daughter tonight, when we were introduced, we talked about the fact that I wish to make a picture on Fred Astaire, and I may have the assignment of going out on the West Coast, and I tried to explain to the young teenage daughter that Fred Astaire is a great artist and a great dancer and more than a, just a cult figure and I wasn't really connecting either with the parents or with the daughter very much, I don't think. And <laughs> at one point the daughter put an end to the conversation by saying, old people are not interesting. <laughs> uh, you do see the connection between the defeats and all the citation and the fact that you don't laugh about it being a series of defeats. You'll find out. <laughs> anyway, back to the Nazis. So, um, what the filmmaker can do, I think, is to offset such personal testimony by showing documents of what actually happened and by making room for the collective memory of these indescribable horrors. This the memory of justice does attempt to do, whether it succeeds, of course, must be left to the sensibilities of the individual spectator. Uh, when, a few months after the theatrical release of the film, of the so-called non-theatrical 16 millimeter college <coughs> circuit was premiered at a university called Brandeis. Uh, some of you may know is a, it's most of you may know is a Jewish university. I think one of the reasons, obviously, must have been the content of the film, and also the fact that the man who was then the president of Paramount Pictures was a, an alumnus of Brandeis. He's no longer the president. He's still presumably an alumnus of Brandeis, but he's no longer the president of Paramount Picture. Turnover there is pretty, pretty uh, rapid. Uh, <laughs> uh, the, and I, I, I was not invited. Uh, I think because they had a panel of, of Holocaust scholars and various international lawyers, and they probably felt that the presence of the filmmaker would cramp their style, which is very understandable. And I understand that after the discussion, um, during the question and answer period, a young student in the back put up his hand, got up, and said, uh, looking rather puzzled, uh, can one of you people there on the panel explain to me? I, I, I don't understand what this, what this man Ophuls is into, what he's about, where he's coming from, what he's going to. Um, why does he bother to interview Albert Speer? Why didn't he just shoot him? <laughs> um, I must confess that if I had been at Brandeis on that particular occasion, the question would probably have knocked me for Lou. Not because I consider it to be beside the point, but on the contrary, because it addresses itself in a rather brutal fashion to the very center of my activities, in a way, to the activities of any documentary filmmaker, whether he's interviewing Speer or not. On the spur of the moment, I probably would have replied very quickly, because I couldn't have found anything else, because I don't believe in shooting people would have been an inaccurate and an incomplete answer because I do believe in shooting some people in some situations. I'm not a pacifist. When I was growing up many years ago, Hollywood High School, my father worked for a time, my father was in movies, and he worked for a time with a very famous and at that time very powerful movie director called Preston Sturgis king of comedy. I was a rather intense, I guess, awkward teenager in a very awkward 
decade with narrow shoulders and a very big Adam's apple. And when I tried to make contact with girls in high school dances, I would never find the right words to say at the right time. Sometimes I still don't. And just froze into some pose of false indifference. One day, Preston Sturgis, one of the most urbane men that I've ever met, and as I said, king of comedy, lady, tried to help me come to terms with these very crucial and very painful defeats of adolescence. Don't worry, Marcel, said. Dialogue is something that comes 20 minutes later. <laughs> I've had a lot more than 20 minutes to think about that young man's question, so I've lately taken to answering it and trying to structure my lectures on campuses to that answer. First of all, there is what I would call the journalistic answer. The journalist goes around shooting his sources. He's not going to get a great deal of information. <laughs> I think that's an easy one. But there is more. There is also, I think, the artistic answer, and I'd like to take a little bit more time on that one because I'd like to think that a documentary filmmaker can and perhaps should be both a journalist and an artist. Even if only in my one. An artist's job consists in trying to convey his understanding of reality, his own reaction to what he sees and feels and hears. The people he portrays in literature, on the stage, or on the screen, I think he must listen to them first. And I think here we can sense how tenuous the line between fiction and non-fiction can become. Not so much in terms of convenient labels and categories based on differences in consumer marketing or production techniques, but rather in terms of creative activity. A novelist who invents, I think quotation marks should be given here, his characters can't really afford to shoot his people either not without first listening to them. Certainly one advantage of shooting Albert Fair would have been that it would have made for a somewhat shorter picture. <laughs> I think there's 40 minutes of it in the film. And if I had transformed our camera team into a firing squad, it would have solved quite a few editing problems. <laughs> but then, war and peace, you see, I am talking about Tolstoy. We were talking about it at dinner. War and Peace could have been not only a shorter, but also a simpler book if Tolstoy had shot Napoleon before the invasion of Russia. It just wouldn't have been a very truthful book, but it would have been simpler in many ways. When I was a much younger man, I used to think that professional writers endlessly reiterated declarations of faith to the, in interviews and in essays and letters and diaries to the effect that they are striving to let the characters go their own way, that the people in their novels would sooner or later escape their control, acquire their own will and their own identity. Well, quite frankly, I used to think, when I started out in fiction movies, that well, a lot of horseshit, literary coquetry, that you had to have charts on the wall, sort of outline of what scene to what scene the characters are going, that they were that they were pawns of your invention, that this was just an elaborate form of literary coquetry, sometimes even an attempt to escape responsibility, like filmmakers at festivals shrugging their shoulders during press conferences and working themselves out of tight corners by saying, ah, well, madam, if that's what you see in my picture, then obviously it must be there. <laughs> <coughs> it sounds very elegant. In fact, it's rather cheap. That particular attitude. The other one, I mean, the, the novelists I now take 
more seriously, and that's really my main point. Nowadays, I think I know better than what I think I've learned about great fiction writing. I think I've learned while making documentaries. My respect and my admiration for Balzac and for Dickens have be has become have become much more profound because now I take them at their word. And I also, the older I get, the more I believe that the mainstream tradition in filmmaking, whether fiction or non-fiction, is the succession of what the classic 19th century novel was to the public in the 19th century. I think this is the main job that movies can do, whether it's like Hitchcock or documentary. <coughs> So, what I want to achieve in the structuring of my own work is a synthesis between my own views, my own insights, such as they are, and the views and the insights of the people that are portrayed in these films, or rather, who portray themselves in them. If I manipulate them too much, if I censor them, if I comment explicitly on what they seek to communicate to me and to you, then I'm not letting them live their own life on the screen. Then I'm choking off whatever unsettling or surprising effect they might have on my own notions or my extension on yours. Then I'm interfering with what their experience might teach us. I'm bringing to a full stop our learning experience, yours and mine. Shooting people would be the most extreme most brutal, and I might add the most irreversible form of such anti-creative manipulation. Let me say one more thing about that, uh, commenting on what the characters tell us. Just now when we were watching Dönitz uh, try to fight his way out of the senile corner he has worked himself into, uh, <clears throat> the temptation was very big, for instance, when he says that he never, he was never an anti-Semite because uh, we were talking about that just now. Chris Long said, well, there never were any Jews in the German Navy. Well, Chris Long has partly German background, and so do I, and we know this. But we also know that a lot of people who are listening to Dönitz presumably don't know that there were. I mean, they just don't make a connection that in the Third Reich there presumably were no Jews in the German Navy. I mean, it's logical to assume that there wasn't, but people aren't perhaps that fast or that logical. So the temptation for the teacher part of me, and then there's the show business part that says, no, 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 but the teaching part has a sort of a tendency to say, well, wait a minute, can we put a freeze frame and a title and just say, there were no Jews in the German Navy? <laughs> you know? I mean, you laugh, but it's, it, it's a serious concern. Because obviously, I mean, I'm, otherwise, to many people, I mean, he, he gets away with, with what is an obvious and, and rather uh, blatant lie. And then I let it go because you can't do everything at once and because I assume that people are in the context attentive and sophisticated enough and fast enough to understand where the contradictions are. Uh, but just as most of us can see a definite connection between anti-Semitic speeches and the extermination camps, even if Gross Admiral Dönitz is unable to do so, so also can we try to discover the connections between absolutist philosophies, intellectual dogmatism, ideological intolerance, and summary executions by firing squads in the past, the present, and the future, which takes us back to what I think is the rather noble attempt of finding an alternative to this in Nuremberg. 
For every one of us, sometime or other, our artistic attitudes, moral convictions, and political purpose must become reconciled. Documentary filmmaker must try to base his working methods, his format, and his style on the coherence of his personal views, on his own observations, and on his approach to life. In my own case, inevitably, the working methods, the format, and the style must therefore be based on my intense belief in the freedom and the responsibility of individuals and in a pluralistic, pragmatic approach to whatever small patches of objective truth we might be equipped to discover. I very much believe in the parable of the blind man and the elephant. So the reason for not shooting Albert Speer in the last analysis is also the reason why I don't use commentary as a narrative technique, why I don't believe in montage theories, and why I make four and a half hour films. My father, who I think was a great movie director, used to say, if you chase after the public all your life, all you ever see is its ass. <laughs> <laughs> Professor Lohman a while ago was referring to a very prominent American art critic uh, who is professor at the University of Chicago. Let's not keep him anonymous for too long. His name is Harold Rosenberg. He is also the art critic of New Yorker magazine. And he went, he went into the greatest diatribe, greatest in length, greatest in violence, against the memory of justice. Uh, he was, he's not, he, not only does he attack the film, he also attacks retrospectively the Nuremberg trial as examples of cheap showmanship and muddle-headed, sentimental, hypocritical, Anglo-Saxon self-indulgence. Howard Rosenberg is worried about the interview with Admiral Carl Dönitz that you have just seen in its entirety. How frivolous and irresponsible of the filmmaker, Rosenberg feels, to let such unrepentant war criminals proclaim their innocence on a big screen to let them communicate their smugness and self-righteousness to public audiences all over the world. He, Rosenberg, knows all about the Holocaust and Nazi crimes, of course. But what about the public? What about those young people? What about the masses? All these millions of people who know so much less about Dönitz and unrepentant Nazis than Harold Rosenberg does. Will they not tend to take the admiral at his word and even sympathize with that poor old man? And is it not the filmmaker's duty in such a case either to avoid interviewing old war criminals altogether or else to point out to all those ignorant spectators, <coughs> preferably in captions or voiceover narration, the wickedness of their ways? The underlying assumption here is that movies are made for the consumption of idiots. It would not occur to the same art critic when writing, for instance, about Jackson Pollock to point out that this is an abstract expressionist and that his paintings must not therefore be judged on the basis of their resemblance to nature. <laughs> when discussing high art, Professor Rosenberg is not addressing the great unwashed. When The Saw and the Pity in the spring of 1971 came out in Paris, it created considerable political scandal. Jean-Paul Sartre at that time was busy editing a Maoist student weekly and trying to get himself arrested selling it publicly in the street. <laughs> Fortunately for the reputation that France still enjoys in some quarters and I hope will continue to enjoy, he did not succeed. Um, his young and very radical co-editors thought that the old man ought to go and see the Saw and the Pity, but to avoid the obvious pitfalls of personalized, decadent, bourgeois criticism, they decided to send two middle-aged coal miners along who had been in the resistance, 
The ensuing tape-recorded discussion between the two coal miners and Jean-Paul Sartre was used in place of a review. The two authentic proletarians, it soon turned out, were as outraged and shocked by the film as the editors had presumably intended them to be. Whenever the German ex-Hauptmann in the film made some disparaging remark about France or about the French resistance, they would equate these statements with the message of the film. The film says, they would declare, the film even says that Alsace-Lorraine is German territory and belongs to Germany. This is very much like uh, people reacting to the Nazi fishermen and saying, uh, the film says that during the Third Reich there was no crime in the street. Um, or else they would say, the film even says that the partisans were cowards because we didn't wear uniforms. I'm perfectly prepared to admit that in order to understand the dramatic uses of irony or the stylistic function of quotation marks, most people must have enjoyed the privileges of a bourgeois education. I say most people because they're always exceptional, particularly gifted individuals. And in the Marxist context, the whole question of artistic communication is indeed a very vexing one. And since, for better or for worse, the bourgeois culture is the one that we are stuck with, I might as well confess that in my quest for as large a potential audience as I can find, I have to resign myself to losing those spectators, by and large, who do not have at least a high school diploma. I'm really and truly sorry about those two coal miners, but I don't have any complexes about it. It doesn't keep me awake at night. Jean-Luc Godard once growled at me while we were having coffee at a bar of a place called La Belle Fayonnière off the Champs-Élysées, and at a time when we were not making movies, either one of us, but trying to. He suddenly got very mad and he pounded the bar. Subtlety, subtlety. You're always talking about subtlety. Subtlety is a form of bourgeois decadence and it is counter revolutionary. <laughs> so be it, what else is new? The curious thing about that discussion between Sartre and the coal miners is that he was one of the great opinion makers of the 20th century a man I deeply and truly respect. One of the most subtle and articulate thinkers of our time, and he didn't open his mouth. For such a gifted pedagogue, it would have been fairly easy to seize the occasion and in a few well-chosen words overcome the cultural lag of the proletariat, at least temporarily. He could have brought these two coal miners up to date and cleared up such obvious misunderstandings. He could have said, for instance, something like this. Well, you know, comrades, I agree with you. This is a shitty film. Pure crap. Can't possibly take it seriously. Very bad film. But I don't think that the German captain is meant to be taken as if he were speaking the truth. On the contrary, I think he probably is there to represent the kind of people you fought against in the resistance. Now, I really don't think those coal miners would have had to know Heidegger or Kierkegaard in order to follow the gist of such an explanation. Now, here's the weird impression I get when I read that Harold Rosenberg worries about young people failing to recognize that Dönitz is a genuine Nazi. And when I'm confronted with Sartre's silence, on the uses of irony in the presence of coal miners. It suddenly occurs to me that they are, at least temporarily, the objective allies of all those cigar-chewing producers I've been trying to fight all my life. Those tin horn dictators who are always proclaiming that it won't play in Peoria. <laughs> and the tragedy of it is that the cynical movie moguls and the elitist professors can turn their jaundiced view of the general public's stunted sensibilities into self-fulfilling prophecies, leaving us to swim 
in a veritable ocean of schlock. And by God, that is what has happened. To the executive producer or the TV bureaucrat, who is always telling me at some rough cut screaming or other, this is too complicated, Marcel, too subtle. If I can't even understand it, how will the man in the street be able to? The only honest answer would be because the man in the street is smarter than you are, dummy. <laughs> because with a little luck, we might find out that his attention spans wide. Because the man in the street doesn't have telephones in screening rooms. Because there might be some men in the street left who don't spend their entire lives hustling deals over lunch, cheating movie technicians on their contracts, <laughs> taking starlets out to dinner, and making asinine remarks at rough cut screen. <laughs> you don't usually say that. <laughs> By that time, your film has become too vulnerable. You've invested too much time to be able to afford the luxury of being honest. You've already had to trample repeatedly on your sponsor's ego just in order to get as far as you've got. So what you wind up saying is some variation of the following. Listen, David or Susan or Sandy, whoever, why don't we wait for the final duck? I tell you, once you hear the music overlap, <laughs> and overlapping on dialogue, and once once the freeze frames and the identification titles come back from the lab, it'll all become crystal clear. <laughs> Men in the streets will come flocking in by the millions. Just wait and see. <laughs> that doesn't always happen. And I must say that by this time, the Davids and the Susans and the Sandys of this world are, 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 are head to that particular tune because it's been used too often. They don't fall for it anymore. Good teaching and good movie making, it seems to me, doesn't consist in talking down to your less talented or less attentive students or audience. Good teaching and good movie making just consists in trying to convey to others what you yourself think you have learned. The essential difference, of course, being that, um, excuse me for sounding bitter on this, uh, that uh, professors can sometimes flunk their students, while audiences can flunk the movie maker. <laughs> the learning and the teaching process, we are often told, are part of a continuous experience. Nowhere have I found this better illustrated than in the course of my recent professional activities. Working on my films has taught me, I think, a great deal about the mental attitudes which one should try to develop for the acquisition of any type of knowledge. Those attitudes are determined by the degree of availability one imposes on oneself. Methods must be developed so that choices can be made, opinions acquired, values defended, while leaving enough room for experience to constantly interfere with judgment. It is also, and by the way, my very deep and very personal conviction that such methods cannot possibly be developed without the prior acceptance of the inevitability of intellectual loneliness. Sometimes, my very happiest moments, three o'clock in the morning on overtime in a London cutting room, I really do feel like I imagine, as I imagine, when <laughs> Lady Balzac must have felt when he was guzzling coffee to meet a deadline. Those are the moments when the material grows stubborn, when it refuses to relinquish its mysteries, its ambiguities, when it refuses to be ordered and categorized into some master plan, when it forces me to restructure my own ideas around it. Then I have to find new links, plunge back into my bag of show business tricks, and say to the public, one moment please, we'll have to try something else. Because it's when the rabbit refuses to jump out of the hat 
that the material says to me, here I am. Just pause a minute to look and to listen. I'm here, I'm real, I may be surprising. I may be a former premier of the French Republic, Pierre Maurice France, suddenly telling you a joke about lovers under a tree when he's trying to escape from prison. Or I may be Albert Speer, refusing to lift the last veil in his headlong rush towards confession. I may be a couple of French farmers from whom you'll never find out whether they killed any Germans or not. Or I may be a mother in Ireland mourning the loss of her child with a soft, mysteriously lilting and poetic phrase, we had a home before, so we had. I may not ever be as clear and as simple as you'd like me to be, but just give me a chance and I may be able to surprise you, and then all you have to do is to hand on that feeling of surprise, that feeling of having learned a little something to your audience. That's after all, it's what you get paid for doing. And can there possibly be an easier way of making a living? Thank you. Well, you were going to say something about Speer. Oh, Speer. Uh, yes, well, I, I don't think we want to go perhaps into it too, too long tonight. Uh, it's a very complicated case. Uh, I think that he is he, of course, is often accused of being totally opportunistic of uh, turning with a win. He doesn't deny that. He denies very little. I mean, that's one of his <laughs> fantasies. Uh, there are, I noticed it just now again, there are moments which, if you listen closely, might make him more credible than he's usually given credit for. And certainly made him more credible to me. I must confess that I have a certain liking for Speer. Like the judges in Nuremberg, uh, at the end of the film, Telford Taylor, one of the prosecutors, said well, the reason why Speer saved his neck in Nuremberg is that the judges uh, all thought that he was the most charming of the defendants and had the most wit and uh, spoke their language. It's a class thing as so much of justice is. Uh, Streicher was hanged because he was an obscene moron and a psychopath. <laughs> he didn't actually kill any Jews, he just advocated their killing. Well, of course, in criminal justice, uh, 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 Jew baiting is not the same as Jew killing. Black baiting is not the same as black killing. Um, but Streicher hanged and Speer got 20 years. Now, according to Taylor, and it's the last statement he makes in the film, uh, uh, according to the evidence and according to the criteria of Nuremberg, if Streicher hangs, certainly Speer should have hanged. The reason he didn't is what he then goes on to explain, this business of his being likable, of his being funny, of his being witty, of his being able to to communicate and to articulate his thoughts. And it's a class thing. And uh, at the end of the film, I actually <coughs> listens to Telford Taylor's statement from across the Atlantic. And I repeat the question to him, but in the film I, I use the voiceover of Telford Taylor's voice over and Speer's listen to this and then he smiles and says, well, if that's what I owe my life to, then I'm grateful that I made such a good impression. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, that's fair. There you have it. Uh, it's, does he, does he, even in all his confessions, does he, does he tell us everything? <coughs> Probably not. Um, is he sincere in his, in his uh, efforts to use himself as a teaching example of what not to become in life? The answer to that is yes. I'm deeply convinced that in that respect he is sincere. 
I mean, the business about is getting a lot of money for bestsellers. That's a lot of junk because he's a very wealthy man and he doesn't need it and his family wants him to shut up and the people in Heidelberg want him to shut up. So, I mean, if he's an opportunist, it's certainly not in that sense. So, uh, yes, I think he's sincere to that extent. I think I said that in class this afternoon. I think, as far as I can figure out, the closest I can get to the spare mystery is that by confessing the magnitude of his guilt, he is at the same time saying, but look here, my opportunism and my responsibility and my complicity in Hitlerism finds in a smaller way a correspondence of some vice president in a corporation. And the reason I'm talking about this to you is don't be an opportunist, don't be that, don't, 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 don't be blinded by ambition, don't use selective memory, don't be a neutralist. And by doing all of that, he is, of course, also pointing out that there are things in us that are like Speer. I think he's right in pointing this out. But this has the magic effect of making him a member of the human race again, uh, in his own eyes. You follow me? And I think that's, I think psychoanalytically that this is probably the reason why he does it. He wants to, he wants to build that bridge. He wants to say, yes, my crimes are bigger, my opportunism is inexcusable, but opportunism is lurking in you too. 